Hello, and welcome to this evening's virtual Denison Connecting event. I'm Tabby Arthur, and I'm a member of the Denison University class of 2014, and I'm also on the digital team here at Denison. Um, tonight's event is brought to you by Denison Connecting, and in a few moments, you can join me in watching Meg O'Dell, a current senior, share with us about Denison Connecting. Denison Connecting adds the power of almost 40,000 alumni and friends to your career network. It's an important part of the Denison Advantage. It means you can be connected to people in the top seats at global companies, to people in the film industry, both on the screen and behind the scenes, to the scientists behind the breakthroughs, to the entrepreneurs who have paved the way before you. Take advantage of your big red heritage through a Denison Connecting event near you. Come connect with us. And you know, Meg is quite a talented singer too. In fact, last summer she starred in the musical Fun Home uh, right next door in Columbus. For tonight's event, we have a great panel to talk with you about careers in financial economics. A couple of guidelines. We'll start off with a few questions and then you, the audience, will have the opportunity to bring your questions to the panel. You can ask us either on Zoom or on Facebook Live. Now I'd like to introduce our host for the evening, Dr. Fadl Kaboob. Fadl is a professor of economics here at Denison um, and the president of the Benziger Institute for Sustainable Prosperity. Fadl has a PhD in economics and social science consortium from the University of Missouri and has held research affiliations with the Levy Foundation, Levy Economics Institute in New York, the Economic Research Forum in Egypt, the John F. Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University and the Center for Full Employment and price stability in Missouri. Bottle? Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us tonight for what looks to be uh, an exciting panel with uh, three Denison alumni uh, who will share their experiences with us about their careers after Denison and how they leverage their liberal arts education, their Denison education, education in the financial industry. Um, we're going to start the conversation uh, today with um, our panelists by um, uh, having, uh, having them maybe spend a couple of minutes telling us a little bit about their career path, um, starting with their post Denison years and, and how, they, um, how they got to where they are today. Um, so with us uh, today, if, if you guys don't mind, we'll start with uh, Kara uh, and then we'll go to David and Rishi. Great. Well, thank you for putting this on. Thank you for allowing me to be part of it. It's great um, to, to do something with and for Denison. So my name is Kara Lewis. I live in Hudson, Ohio, which is near Cleveland. I'm a 1995 graduate. And I would say that my career definitely hinged on um, the experiences I began at Denison. So I took advantage of what was then called May term. And in interns for a company that's called Oak Associates, Jim Olschlager, who many of you may know as the donor um, behind the Talbot Hall. Um, he gifted the money to build Talbot Hall. So he was a big advocate for Denison and took an intern every year. So I was an intern at Oak Associates for two years after my sophomore year and after my junior year. And Oak Associates was a money management firm. We managed money for both private clients, but primarily large institutions, large pension plans. Think Dallas Fire and Police, Ohio Public Employees Retirement System, um, California Public Employees Retirement System, et cetera. And so it was that that really gave me the bug uh, for investing and for the markets. And I was offered a job after my senior year and I think much to Jim Olschlager's surprise, I turned him down, uh, which was probably the, the best thing I could have done. It was a really small boutique firm. And I knew that I loved the culture of the firm. I knew that I loved the industry, but I felt like I needed sort of more big picture corporate experience. And I ended up working in, as an employee benefits consultant uh, for a firm called Unum, which is now Unum Provident for about five years. And throughout that time, essentially it was employee benefits, but it was insurance at the end of the day. And Jim Olschlager would occasionally send me, literally send me newspaper articles about the fabulous success his firm was having. And he would put sticky notes like, when are you going to stop selling insurance and come back and work here? Um, so about five years later, we were, I was married, ready to have a baby and decided that it'd be great to move back um, to Northeast Ohio and work for Oak. 
Um, and so from there, I've moved a couple places. Um, I was there during the tech crunch and crisis. So probably the six years that I spent actually as an employee at Oak, I learned more than you know many people learned in a lifetime, not having gone through a rough market like that. Um, and then for nine years after that, I spent at a smaller boutique firm in the money management business and was a partner and president of that firm. And then 2005 made a shift back to a much bigger firm, um, to A.B. Bernstein, um, which is a large global money management firm. But again, the roots of my career definitely trace back to those experiences at Denison and taking advantage of opportunities there. Very good, thank you. Um, we'll, we'll go to David next. Uh, and David, if, if you could uh, walk us through your career path uh, since your Denison days. Sure, and thank you again for, for having me. Um, my name is David Gordon. I live in Dover, Massachusetts, outside of Boston, uh, class of 1991 at Denison. Um, you know, I took kind of a winding road to get to where I am now. Uh, right after college, I actually moved to Australia and played baseball there for a year. Um, kind of came back and was looking for a job. Some of my Denison buddies lived in Boston. I'm from Chicago. So I moved out to Boston um, and got a job at what was at the time Bank of Boston's credit training program. Uh, I did that for, that was a year program and I got placed in our media group. I did uh, lending to casinos and movie studios um, for the first couple of years. And um, really that was when the internet was really starting to take off. It was uh, like 94, 95. Um, I convinced the bank to do their first ever technology uh, software loan, which was for a company called Amazon, which was uh, a deal that the, the bank had not been in. It was their first syndicated credit facility. Um, we got into the, the bank agreed to do that. It was not easy at the time. Um, as a matter of fact, I, I remember the head of our uh, consumer group saying, um, the internet's just for teenage boys and these guys will never take over Barnes and Noble or any, any of the online or the, uh, <laughs> the, the bricks and mortar uh, businesses. But it, that really got me interested in technology. It was an exciting time. So I actually was able to join a boutique investment bank that focused on technology and, and really leveraged that uh, knowledge I gained through the Amazon situation to work for Robertson Stevens. I stayed at Robertson Stevens uh, until the tech explosion um, where uh, basically the, the, the bank ended up going, uh, was, was uh, closed down by Fleet Bank that had bought Bank of Boston. Um, but because I had some background in gaming, I knew a lot about real estate and so was able, just as tech was going down, to jump onto the real estate wagon. Joined the RBC Capital Markets. Um, they were starting a real estate uh, group in America. They had, obviously had a big one up in Canada. I did that for a number of years, um, and then actually a bunch of people that I had worked with at Bank of Boston, um, which it was now had been Fleet Bank, and now was Bank of America had just bought them. Were not enjoying their time at Bank of America, so they joined um, uh, as a group, Key Bank in two thousand and four. So they had known me; they were looking for a new investment banking arm. So they uh, asked me to come over and, and run the investment banking group. And I have been there since, I'm still there, I've been there since 2004. Excellent. Um, next, we'll go to Rishi and we'll hear about his career path since uh, leaving Denison. Thanks a lot and thanks for having me here. Um, so I was actually very, very fortunate when I was starting to, or trying to look into my career options. Um, I got, had the help of two Denison alumni, one of which who first offered me an internship um, and there was another person who would then help me get an interview at J.P. Morgan. And I think uh, the first alumni uh, was a hedge fund in uh, New York. And for coming from Denison, getting the opportunity to spend three months in New York, uh, learning about the industry made a huge difference, I think, uh, as I was interviewing for J.P. Morgan, uh, which when I interviewed for J.P. Morgan, the fact that being from Denison, having an internship with hedge fund um, helped me get into the derivatives space. And that's where I've been for the past 10 years. I started out in Chicago and I was there for about 10 months, but very quickly realized that if you want to be in finance and if you really want to learn, especially starting out, you kind of want to be in New York because that's where uh, a lot of the activity happens. And especially when I started in 2005, which was basically 
the peak of the financial or right before the crisis. So that was the peak of when all the banks were booming. There was a lot of activity going on. And so I managed to get a chance to move within my group uh, to New York. And uh, that was basically 12 years ago. While I was at JP Morgan in 2007, at the absolute peak, um, I had banks calling me, trying to recruit me, and I felt fantastic. And so I switched jobs and moved to a British bank who uh, basically went pretty much bankrupt at the, at the bottom of the crisis. And so, you know, just three years out of college, being stuck in the, in, a, in the financial crisis and having a direct impact, I think, made a big difference for me. Whether, you know, looking back now, I think I was still pretty naive to not understand how, how big everything was and how bad things were getting. Uh, I did lose my job and, and during the crisis from, the financial, from that bank. However, a couple of months later, I was able to start up with a Japanese bank who was trying to build a business in the U.S. Uh, and was recruiting a lot of people from other banks to build that business out. Um, and I was there for about three years. And then now I'm with a Canadian bank called CIBC, essentially doing the same thing within derivatives, uh, advising large corporates on managing interest rate risk. And I think the reason why I kind of moved here was, a, it's a much smaller platform. So at this point in my career, I kind of want to have a freedom to build something, but, um, but not having the pressure of constantly being, when you're at a big bank, there's a lot of different pressures you have to deal with. And so being at a smaller place now, I think kind of, um, that's kind of a very interesting point for me in my career now. Excellent. Thank you. Um, there's there's a, a lot of discussion these days about um, what makes a successful career is often linked to building strong relationships uh, while on campus with, with faculty members and faculty mentors uh, during the four years that, spend, that students spend at Denison. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering if uh, each one of you could uh, share a story about some of those relationships that you've built with, with mentors and, and faculty while here at Denison. Um, because today there's a lot of uh, Denison students actually and other alums who are watching and listening to us. So we would love to hear uh, some of these, uh, these stories. So we'll start with uh, Kara again. Am I going to go first every time? No, I'm kidding. Uh, no, we're going to mix it up a little bit. <laughs> All right, good. Um, well, I, so I started out uh, with an advisor that was in the mathematics department, and I quickly realized that that wasn't a good fit. And I think early in my first semester, freshman year, I had lucked out and Laura Boyd was assigned to me or I was assigned to her. And so I took many classes from Laura Boyd, who's still there, as well as her husband, David Boyd. And we just, we definitely created a, you know, a friendship as well as a student um, professor relationship. And I don't necessarily, I can't pinpoint something that she, you know, helped guide me in terms of my career. But I would say to this day, I guess however many years that is later, we still send each other a holiday card. Um, and we, you know, have watched her kids grow up, but she was pregnant with her first daughter um, during one of my years, I forget what year it was. And now her daughter's off to college and she's seen me, you know, go through transition. So it's, it's definitely been a tie back to Denison and we try to get together every once in a while as well. I believe Laura's uh, daughter just graduated college last year. All right, there you go. See, I guess I'm not quite that up on it, but I did get a holiday card this year. <laughs> yes, that's wonderful. Thank you. Um, so I'll I'll go to uh, Rishi, uh, and then we'll go to David next. Thanks. Um, so I think for me, being an international student, um, as much as the mentorship I had with professors, I think for me initially starting out, it was really helpful to have some of the people working in the international department that helped me settle in, sort of get fit into the culture of studying in the US, but also adjusting to a very different lifestyle to what I was used to. I think one of the persons that actually has had the most impact on me from a career perspective that I still keep close touch with is actually not a professor, but uh, works in the annual fund department. Uh, Greg Bader, who was my um, boss at the time, I guess, he just started out. And because he was new and I was a student manager, we kind of connected because I helped him sort of settled into the job. And he very quickly, you know, started asking me, okay, what kind of, uh, you know, what kind of jobs are you looking for? What kind of future are you looking for? And the moment he found out that I was very interested in finance, he went out of his way to connect me to alumni and ultimately connected me to Trent who got me the job at JP Morgan. Uh, funnily enough, Kara, I had 
seven of my nine economics classes with, <laughs> with the Boyd as well. So David Boyd was my David Boyd Boyd was my uh, a professor that you know, I connected most with and I had most of my classes with. I think he has a very no nonsense attitude where he'll give you the answer and help you to the extent you need it, but um, you know he'll guide you in the right way and he. He, he kind of doesn't try to sugarcoat things, and which actually is helpful and good when you're trying to ask for advice on, especially looking for jobs or what to expect in the real world. Excellent. Uh, David, uh, you're next on the mentor's uh, relationship. Thanks. You know, I, I thought a lot about this as a, as a history and a major and political science minor. I, you know, I, I didn't have a relationship with a, with a teacher that I think really helped throughout my career, but, I, but you know, a, a professor that I did have was David Sorensen in political science, who, um, you know, really got me very interested in politics and in Middle East politics. Um, he, you know, I was in his class um, when the first Gulf War was just breaking out. I didn't really know much about, uh, you know, that part of the world. I didn't know much about the politics that were going on there. And, uh, David was a, a you know a war college general who was very knowledgeable um, about the conflict, about the various countries and everything that was going on around there. And we would spend a lot of time just talking through it, and you know, not really opinions one way or the other, but more just him taking the time to educate me about um, what was happening in the area, why he thought it was happening, you know, as this this conflict was beginning to play out. He was explaining to me what was, was going on. And really, um, you know, I'm very interested in the Middle East. I'm very interested in, in politics. And I think a lot of that was formed during uh, the years talking to, to Professor Sorensen. Excellent. Um, David, I'm gonna follow up with, the, with a question for you. Uh, and I'll have a, a different question for each one of our panelists. Um, the liberal arts skills that our students develop uh, during the four years they spend here at Denison. Uh, given that you're a product of the liberal arts, how do, how do people lever leverage those skills, those habits, the, the critical thinking skills, the communication skills in a professional setting? Uh, and the part that's related to this is how do we uh, better communicate those skills to employers and, and HR departments who are recruiting from, uh, from Denison? Yeah, you know, and the it's an, it's an interesting question. I, I do think, it, especially in the investment banking industry, it, it can be tough coming out of, uh, you know, coming out of liberal arts college because you do have kids that have focused in, you know, from the very beginning of their college careers on, on doing this business. But, but I really think, and, and, and I strongly believe that the education you get at a liberal arts college really helps you throughout your career much beyond you know your first job and i think it's really what, what i really enjoyed about it and what i like hiring kids who have liberal arts educations is because they have learned many different things you're you're surrounded by people um not not just economics majors if you're at a big university and that's what you've decided to do you know that that's everyone around you is focused on that i really like people to have a more broad education um and, and that really helps you throughout your career. I mean, I think about what I do, you know, the, the job that you have as an analyst is extremely different than the job that you have as a vice president, which is also extremely different than the job that you have as a managing director. And I think, you know, really learning about different people, because that's a big part of what I do, is, is forming personal connections. I think liberal arts colleges, and Denison in particular, I think does an extremely good job at that. Um, you know, how can Denison do a better job uh, to recruiters and hiring managers? I, you know, I would say, first off, don't be apologetic about the fact that we're a liberal arts college and these kids, uh, the kids there are getting a, a more broad based education. Um, I think that's a, a positive and I think, you know, the school needs to continue to <laughs> relationships with the various institutions and, and make sure that uh, you're getting everybody out in front of the right people early in the process. Um, but I think, you know, uh, KeyBank's hired a number of Denison students over the years. And um, as far as I know, they've all, all those hires have gone extremely well. And I think that's another thing to just point out is, you know, people have, people have thrived. And, and in fact, when I think about KeyBank, 
Um, Chris Gorman, who's number two at the firm, was a Miami of Ohio graduate. Randy Payne, who runs the investment banking group, was a DePaul graduate. So, um, you know, there are a lot of liberal arts graduates in the industry, even though, you know, you don't hear about that as much in the media. So I'm, I'm going to follow up with, uh, with a similar question with, with Rishi, because my guess is that um, when all three of you were here at Denison, you didn't really take classes that specifically taught you the particular uh, uh, sort of detailed skills that anybody expects uh, in the financial industry. Um, so my question is, what kinds of links do you see between your Denison education and how it prepared you for doing well in a, in a career path that presumably has very little to do in terms of specific coursework preparation for being successful in, in financial markets? I, mean, I think I, I echo what David just said. I faced the exact same problem. Um, starting out, especially at JP Morgan, I was surrounded basically by, you know, most of the graduates were from Ivy League, uh, had studied finance for the last four years, um, probably worked at banks or, or their summers. Um, and so, you know, I think starting out, it, it is a little bit daunting, uh, kind of you feel a little bit left behind. But I think very quickly what you realize is that if you are good at you know, finance and numbers, ultimately you kind of pick all that up and it's not that big a disadvantage. And I think the big advantage you do get from Denison, uh, which you know, a lot of people don't get when you go to big schools is the, you know, I love the small classrooms, the, the personal sort of uh, interaction you have with professors where you have critical thinking, you're, you know, you're challenging them, they're challenging you. And you're, you're learning how to think about things, not just kind of take notes of what the professor and a lot of cases, you know, student uh, assistants are telling you. And I think oh, for me personally, that has been a, a big help over the years. And I work in derivatives. And so essentially a lot of times we are coming up with ideas, we're coming up with solutions for clients. And I think being able to think outside the box has helped me, um, you know, move ahead in career, whereas some people are kind of, a lot of people are stuck thinking in a very rigid way of doing things. Um, so I think, you know, one of the, one of the key things that they, uh, I think the Denison prepares you, which maybe you don't realize it right off the bat, is that you are better prepared in the longer run to think about things and deal with problems as they arise versus uh, people who are thought in a very rigid way and, and sort of don't go out of that, that box. Um, it's a relatively similar question for, for Kara. Um, Kara, you've, you've had quite a bit of success in your, in your career, uh, leading you to a, uh, an important position at A.D. Bernstein and sitting on several boards in, in the Cleveland Akron area. Um, my question is, there must have been challenges in, in the lead up to your current position throughout your career. And any, any words of wisdom, words of advice for young alumni from Denison who are starting their career and, and Denison students who are soon uh, entering uh, this particular career path? Uh, challenges and, and potential opportunities and, and how, to, how to leverage uh, the Denison education in, in that path. Yes, this is an interesting question as I pondered what my response might be, but I think it's a, an interesting intersection between, you know, being bold, being confident in all those skills that we just talked about that the liberal arts education provides, but also being patient and, you know, finding mentors and relationships in those first jobs is so important. And, you know, being patient to wait your turn, just as David talked about being an analyst, being a VP, being a managing director, it's not going to happen all at once. Uh, you know, we might think we can come out of Denison and, and rule the world. Um, that doesn't happen. And so, again, being confident, but balancing that out with being patient, I would say, and, and finding your voice. I think and from, a, from a board perspective, um, so I sit on Akron Children's Hospital Board. I initially started out on the foundation board, which is a fundraising entity, essentially, um, then joined the investment committee, have since joined the actual hospital board. And I think I'm proud of there are four women on the board and I'm maybe the only one under 50. Um, I'm now the vice chair of the investment committee and I'm certainly the only one under probably 55. Um, but it's, it takes time and patience and I didn't just speak up at once and you know, speak my mind on the day one. I had to sort of figure out the personalities and that, that applies to a board as well as a company. Um, figure out personalities, figure out 
you know, when it's appropriate to share new ideas, but don't be afraid to do it. But, you know, um, find out the nuances because every company has nuances to their culture, et cetera. And um, I don't think it's, it's reasonable to expect that you can come in in any organization or any board day one and, you know, take over. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we, we have quite a few people watching on, on Zoom and on Facebook Live, so we'll be going to a Q&A session uh, in a few minutes. But before we do that, I wanted to ask one more question, um, sort of in closing to, to David and Rishi and, and Kara, feel free to, uh, to weigh in as well. Uh, any, any final words of uh, wisdom, words of advice for Denison students in particular who are in their senior year, starting their career soon and, and exploring this particular career path in, in the financial industry. I'll start with David. Yeah, and I would say even before your senior year, um, you know, my, my, my best advice is, is start early. You know, the, the, biggest, um, the biggest problem I have try, help, trying to help kids is, you know, we are general, like a bank like KeyBank, I think most banks now do uh, internships after junior year. And they've basically filled those internships, um, you know, by October. And, uh, you know, I know in particular us, but many other banks know about too, then hire their upcoming analyst class out of those internships. So, you know, work with the school, work with any contacts you have. Um, you know, you, you, you don't want to be late to that process. Um, and, and I would also add, you know, after you start your first job, um, that, that doesn't necessarily mean that's the job you're going to do the rest of your life. Um, you know, I would suggest you work hard, you form relationships both at your own level and, and up the chain and use those relationships. I mean, Kara touched on it, but you, I think you really want to form strong relationships with the senior members. Don't be afraid to ask any questions. Uh, senior people want you to ask questions. They want to get to know you. Um, you know, I think about it in banking, don't be afraid to sit down with your boss and talk about what you want out of your career. And you may even say, Hey, David, you know, I'm just not into real estate. I, I joined the group and, and I thought I was, but I'm not, you know, what other industries do you think I could go into? And could you help me do that? You know, I love it having those types of conversations. I think most managers do. And if you're a good employee, wherever you are is going to want to keep you. So they want to do um, Rishi, um, it's, uh, we're, we're getting a little bit of background noise, but I, I hope you're still with us. Yeah, um, no, sorry about that. It's okay. like in New York, unfortunately. Sorry. Okay, so we know you're in New York. <laughs> um, uh, Rishi, you're next for uh, some uh, words of advice. Yeah, absolutely. I think, uh, I think David was absolutely right. If you're looking for a job in finance, and especially if you want to join uh, one of the investment banks, you know, or banks in New York or Chicago, I think what you need to realize is your first semester junior year is critical. You know, start reaching out to alumni, um, applying to internships. I think it's very important to get some relevant internship in finance. Even It doesn't need to be at the, the, you know, the bank you want to be at. But even if it's your local bank, some place uh, that's relevant, that gives you an opportunity to talk about what you did that summer, I think is very important. I think people you know, don't realize you know, when we get resumes, and I, I was on an interview committee for a couple of my previous jobs, you know, we get 100, 150 resumes for five positions. Nobody's really going through what you did. I think that there are very quick things you look at. You know, very, very important to have your GPA up there, even if, you, if it's not great. Because if you don't have a GPA, that's a big red flag right off the bat. Um, you know, having relevant internships up front and not spending a lot of time talking about what you might have done in the summer working at a, at a, at a retail store, etc. cetera. Um, I think, as David touched, people need to realize it's finance by October. If you don't have a job, your senior year, you are done. You're not going to be getting a job at any of the big banks because that's when they fill all their positions. And I think for me, the biggest surprising part when I talk to people is they don't realize that. Uh, partly because, you know, while Denison being in Ohio has a lot of its advantages, for finance, I think the biggest disadvantage versus schools in the Ivy League or New York especially, is these kids are being, you know, they have companies coming, pushing them, or they're constantly focused on one aspect, right? It's getting a job within finance or, or whatever career within finance. And so I think, I think that's the biggest thing that people need to wake up to and, and realize is, 
make sure you're applying early. You start thinking about it your junior year, where you want to go. And also, I think within finance, you know, you've heard David and myself and Kara talk about, there's so many different things you could be doing. I mean, when I joined, when I got my first job, I had no idea what asset derivatives were. Um, I just got, you know, lucky and, and it's worked out well for me. But try and understand there's a lot of different things. You could be doing sales, you could be doing trading, you could be doing investments. Uh, you can be advising companies. Um, so I think talk to alumni, talk to people and try and understand what the different sectors are and see what might sound more interesting one versus the other. Maybe try and pursue that. Uh, that being said, as again, David touched, if you're good and if you get your foot in, you can always move around. So it's not, it's not the end of the world if you don't get the perfect job they're looking for. Uh, but I think my one advice would be start early. Thank you. And Kara, if, if you have uh, a, a few final words of advice for, for the students before we go to the questions from Facebook Live and, and Zoom. Sure. I mean, I think I would echo some of the, of course, echo these comments, but it, you know, it comes back to relationships, 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 right? To start building those early. Um, and also think about that, you know, there are some things in life that are forever, but your career path is not. Um, so like Richie mentioned, just because you don't end up in the right place the first time that's the right fit, you know, everybody's career path is, is winding. Mine's been a little more linear, um, but who knows going forward, it could be more windy. So, you know, keep after it. Uh, you can continue to evolve, um, but, but in my opinion, focus on relationships, even in the technical space such as finance. Thank you. Um, well, now I think we're ready for some questions from uh, Facebook Live and, and from Zoom, and I'll, I'll pass the baton to Tabby. So our first question is, um, for anyone who would like to answer, what do you know now about your field that you wish you would have known when you started out? For me personally, I think the biggest thing I, I wish I, I knew more about what the different areas of finance were. Uh, you know, growing up, all I knew was investment banking, and that's all I thought I wanted to get into. I got lucky and I didn't end up in investment banking, but I think knowing the different parts, maybe I would have done, you know, trading or investments or tried to pursue something a little bit different. So I think that is one thing that I would again advise people to talk to alumni in finance or friends and just try and figure out what different things and what do these different jobs mean. It was, it was not the easiest beginning for me when I got into investment banking. Um, you know, I, I, did not understand uh, you know, very quickly the hours that you have to put in, um, you know, how much it affects your life. Um, I'm not sure I would have done it had I known all that, but I, I really enjoyed the job, but I did not go in um, fully understanding that. And, it, and honestly, it caused, you know, my first two years were rocky roads in investment banking, just kind of getting my arms around it. Kara, uh, how about you, Kara? I mean, nothing really unique. I think Rishi's comments are really important. Even this, this panel tonight is evidence of the fact that finance is a really broad term and there's a lot of different career paths that you can take even within this umbrella. So understanding that and understanding what fits your skill set, your personalities, your desires for, you know, working crazy hours, travel, et cetera, is, is important to, to think about. Not necessarily have all the answers when you're in college, but to think about and explore. Um, we also have a question about specific areas in finance that are most trendy right now and what other areas might be trending down because of tech or other factors? I'll jump in just because I'm in the real estate world and say, you know, a lot of the business that I do is public real estate companies, taking companies public, doing follow-ons. Uh, that is not hot right now. <laughs> <laughs> with, uh, with interest rates going up, the REITs have been hit hard. Private real estate's pretty hot. Um, you know, I'm, I'm always intrigued by tech. I think tech's really interesting and fun, um, very hard to do. Um, and e energy is obviously, a, and energy and healthcare, I think, are the other two areas um, that, that I look at. And lots of really interesting things happening, lots of change happening, and lots of uh, neat companies to work with and smart entrepreneurs in, in the industries. I would say from the investment perspective, I mean, long only equity shops aren't necessarily the hottest place to be, which was where I was at Oak. Uh, Bernstein is obviously a very big global firm, so we have you know certain areas that are, are um, more attractive from an investment perspective than others. Two spaces that I'm not involved in necessarily that I think you know hedge funds being in a you know working for a hedge fund like Rishi did when he graduated was probably one of the hot jobs. Maybe not as much anymore. Private equity um, is 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 intriguing, but there's a lot of different flavors of private equity as well. And and I think 
you know, it's it's hard to say. So, for example, for what I do as derivatives, the last three years were probably the toughest years. But now as interest rates are going higher and David's clients are getting hit, it's actually a good time for my business because volatility in interest rates is what we want and help let, let's clients uh, get into hedging. So I think, you know, trends will keep changing and depending on what product or what part of the bank you're in, uh, they will keep changing as well as markets change. But I think what the key thing uh, you should take away with you, as you especially starting a career, is to make sure you, you're experiencing and you're working really hard uh, and building relationships like everybody else has mentioned, because that's what's really gonna matter when times are tough and you might need help, maybe switching jobs or you're out of a job and looking for something new. Um, we have a question from a recent alum who works in the industry. Um, she's wondering if you recommend any certifications and wondering also about graduate school. Is it more important than experience or is it a good balance of both? Uh, I'll start, you know, I can't think of certifications. I mean, if you're gonna go into the research world, um, people do get their CFA. Um, uh, and what was the second half of the question again? Graduate school. Graduate school. You know, I, I do not have a graduate degree. I am, I am very much in the minority. Um, you know, I think it really depends on your situation. So, um, you know, I decided not to do it because when I would have gone and was, you know, I was an associate in a tech investment bank in 1998 and the market was just going crazy. And honestly, I didn't want to, I didn't want to miss it. Um, but if you're in, in a job and you feel like, in my, my opinion would be, if you feel like you've done what you can do in that job and, and there's more opportunities for you to get a graduate degree. I, I don't think there's a stock answer, but you know, that that's when I see most people doing it and enjoying it and being successful with it. Yeah, I think I agree. Um, I think in terms of, especially if you're looking at uh, a graduate school, you have to weigh that against where you are and the cost of taking two years off from work and paying for the school. And a lot of jobs in banking and finance now don't really require you to necessarily leave your field, go to an MBA and come back, uh, which used to be the case, you know, few, maybe 10, 15 years ago. And so it really, I think the, the MBA would be really helpful if you are stuck in a place where you want to make that jump to a different field or maybe a completely different bank because you got into a top school and that allows you to do that. And everyone continue to send questions in. We do have time for a few more. Um, you've all mentioned a couple of things about the crazy work-life balance. Um, how do you keep a work-life balance with working so many hours and um, just staying on top of everything? I would say it's never really in balance. <laughs> it's sort of a, a flow. I travel quite a bit. I have four kids. I have a husband who works. Um, and I love what I do. So I think, if, number one, if you love what you do, um, I just view it as sort of an integrated life and work. And, you know, there are times when work wins out. There's times when, when family works and wins out. Um, but I think being passionate about it. And as you move on, even though I probably work crazy hours, I have some flexibility, which is probably not going to happen right when you're out of school. Uh, but that's something to look forward to, that even if you're working a lot of hours, having more control over those hours and having some flexibility is, is important. Yeah, and I would say, you know, things are, are, are getting better in finance. I know most banks, KeyBank included, has put in a bunch of rules about how many weekends in a row you can work. And, you know, we, we make our analysts take uh, a vacation every six months now so that it's, it's required so that managing directors can't force them to stick around. Um, but look, it's, it, it, you know, it's hard those first couple of years. It's still hard for me. I do a lot of travel. Um, but, you know, the first couple of years, I wasn't doing a lot of travel. I was just stuck at my desk, you know, doing models and running pitch books. And um, it, it's very hard, especially at, at that level, to, to seek balance. Um, it won't be balanced. It's going to be an imbalance. But you want to, you know, my advice would be when you have free time that you can take, take it. Don't worry too much about FaceTime. Um, I, I never see that mattering as much as people think it thinks it does. Um, more important is that you, you put in the time to do a quality project when you're given one. Yeah, I, I agree definitely, especially the first couple of years are always hard. You're trying to settle in and figure out what you know what, what's expected from you. But again, this also goes back a little bit to different parts of finance. So I work in sales and trading, and so sales and trading has long hours, but they start early and they kind of end early. You know, I'm usually out of work by when I, even as an analyst when I started out, I was usually out by six or seven p.m. But I started out at seven a.m. And so I think, again, depends on, you know, investment banking, you start a little bit late, but like David said, you, you put in 
very long hours. Um, and so it's very, dip, it's, it's important to, I guess, if your work-life balance is an important part, you know, kind of understand what different fields within banking mean as well. And you've all touched on this a little bit, but um, do you have some advice for recently graduated or soon to graduate seniors that might not have the luxury of our new financial economics major or concentration? Um, how can they gain education in specific areas like accounting, corporate finance, and other things that non-liberal arts graduates might have even majored in? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll start. And, and really, uh, you know, some of those I don't know in accounting, um, but, you know, and I think Rishi talked about this as well. It's really, you know, if you, if you have figured out where you'd like to start your career, it's really just getting in the door. We've talked about it a lot, but, you know, if, if you want to get into banking, um, you know, most of these banks are big banks. There's a lot of ways in through the front door. And, and as I was mentioning, you know, I would take the time to get to know senior people at the bank and, and talk to them about what you ultimately want to do um, and, and find your way there. You know, as I mentioned, I started in commercial lending in the gaming industry and moved over into technology just by, you know, keeping my eye on the technology market and finding something that I thought made sense and, and going into it. Um, you know, I think that is probably translatable across any, any number of different industries. Yeah, I think it's, it's important when you're starting out, especially to make sure, even if you're not entirely happy, make sure that you're building a relationship, but also putting in good quality work and people are happy with you. Because I think most banks and most institutions value uh, employees, especially, you know, those coming out of college, that they spend a lot of time training. And so if you want to move around, there's always career opportunities, whether it's moving internationally, to different parts of the bank. But I think the key part to that is not to be agitated and not to start complaining about things, but to do it in a constructive way and do it, make sure you are talking to the right people, building the relationships and making sure you're not trying to, you know, um, you're not talking negatively about anybody, but looking more as a constructive feedback and trying to build a career for yourself and what might be of interest to you, um, I think is, is very important. Um, are cryptocurrencies and blockchain already changing how you do things? Uh, to what degree should those interested in finance careers be ramping up on those technologies? Um, I don't know about anybody else, but that's made no change to my life other than <laughs> you hear about it on CNBC 10 times a day, what, what Bitcoin's doing. Uh, I mean, I, I don't see how that's going to change anything, at least in the near term. Maybe in the future, I'm sure technology behind it is, um, is great and will lead to some changes, but from my perspective and where I sit is just a speculative currency that just goes up and down with, you know, it creates a lot of noise, but it hasn't changed anything. I would say from our perspective, I get a lot of client questions about it, but that's the only thing that maybe increase the flow of questions. Um, again, yeah, the, the, the technology behind blockchain may provide some sort of evolution, but it's going to be a ways out. And Bitcoin itself has not had any sort of impact. <laughs> no impact for me. <laughs> so we probably have time for two more questions. Uh, we have one. Uh, what are you most excited about for the future of finance um, in your individual fields? I, mean, I think I think from our perspective, from my perspective personally, what's exciting for me is at least getting ahead in my career and being able to do things differently, or maybe you know, hopefully in the future, maybe run a group. Uh, but just for the future of finance, I think things are evolving fast in terms of. How, how technology is moving around, but I think end of the day, uh, I, and I think a lot of a lot of different groups are now being basically run by computers. So I think that is the most interesting part is how technology is now starting to take over, and it's making life very easy in a lot of in, a, in, a, in some ways, but it's also you know making it harder for people to have a job in certain fields as well. For me, my answer is a little bit different because I am in a little bit different space. I. There's a massive amount of wealth transfer happening that you can read about from you know, generational wealth transferring. And so we deal a lot with business owners, entrepreneurs, multi-generational families who are thinking about um, you know, a liquidity event, selling a business, and you know, how does that help their future generations? But there's a lot of exciting parts about philanthropy and what they're going to do with that money and how they're going to create their second legacy. Maybe their first legacy was... Um, owning a bunch of real estate or owning a manufacturing company. And then they, they sell that to private equity. And then what do they do with that, that big pile of money, essentially? And so those are really exciting. I think that, that that's going to continue. There's a trend, the baby boomers that are looking to transfer that wealth. And so there's a lot of opportunity in, in the private wealth space. 
and it's very rewarding to help these families think about their future and incorporate philanthropy in that. Yeah, for me in, in, in real estate, it's really, you know, it's always exciting for, for me and, and we uh, really what our group does is, is focus on a lot of the non-traditional real estate sectors. So we got in big with data center real estate, which is kind of a, a tech real estate blend um, in the student housing. All Denison doesn't have any of these dorms. A lot of our, our clients build uh, these incredible dormitories across larger universities. Um, we have an energy play REIT that we're forming, which is you know, one of the first in that area. So it's really trying to find um, new and different types of ideas uh, to bring to the public markets. And, um, and uh, you know, using technology at the bank has certainly made things a lot easier too. So I always get excited whenever we, we, we get a new upgrade, um, which, you know, back in the day, we used to have to order 10 Qs and Ks and take a week to get to us. It's nice to have all that at your fingertips now. Um, since this is Denison Connecting, what advice would you have for young alums or current students when they're first reaching out with someone, reaching out to someone in the industry? Um, how would you recommend they begin an email or an in-person introduction? Yeah, I mean, I've actually spoken to a, to a number of, of uh, students at Denison, and you know, for me, it's it, I like to see I am a, I'm a you know senior, junior at Denison University, interested in getting into the financial field. Would love to to pick your brain. Um, you know, I'm always willing to, to spec time when I can, um, to walk through it. Um, but you know, I, I wouldn't badger people with too many phone calls. I'd, I'd send in a, an email that explains what you're looking to do and, and you know, that you want to take a little bit of somebody's time and, you know, that, that tends to work. Great. I mean, I, one of the things that worked for me when I was going through the same process was, you know, I used to go visit Chicago or go to New York and I would just ask people if they'll be free for a quick coffee or you know, if they'll be get on the phone or answer some questions. And, you know, I think one thing you should realize is a lot of people in finance are pretty busy. So you know, if you send out five emails, you might hear from one person back, but don't get discouraged. Uh, end of the day, there's a very important thing that connects you to alumni and it's the denizen and the shared experience you have there. Um, and most people want to help. Uh, and so I think, you know, just reach out to a few people that look interesting, you know, make the effort to maybe make a visit to the city to try and meet them, meet for a coffee and try and see if you can build a little bit of a personal relation. Because I think if you're looking for answers, e email works, but if you're looking for help beyond that, I think having a personal connection and putting in some effort uh, would definitely be more helpful. And, and you know, that definitely worked for me. I think acknowledging and putting either in the subject line or early on the Denison connection is important. That would make me more likely to respond to an email. I think even acknowledging, you know, would you be willing to have a 20 minute conversation that, you know, could lead to other, other interactions like Rishi mentioned. I think just even acknowledging, you know, that they don't have, you know, limitless time, maybe, or even, you know, saying a 15 to 20 minute conversation or being very specific. Um, I'm also a stickler for grammar in the email. Um, so I would make sure that that email is really well written. I know that probably seems really particular, but uh, that's one of my hot buttons. It's important. So it looks like we have one last question. Um, what is your, your favorite newspaper, online news, research, or TV channel to keep up with the markets? Um, how do you stay up with everything outside of work? Well, I have a nice 45-minute uh, train ride into the city. So I read the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, and the Boston Globe on my way in. Um, and, you know, I watch CNBC pretty much throughout the, throughout the day. I think for me, it's Wall Street Journal and then Bloomberg. We sit in front of Bloomberg and news is constantly updating. Um, so that's basically what I, I, I kind of keep up with the, the markets. I would echo that. I think if you want a more global perspective, the Financial Times is great. I don't keep up with it as much as I used to, but that's another great resource. Yeah, I should, I should have added as well. I mean, I... You know, I follow a lot of financial uh, areas on Twitter, um, you know, ranging from Barron's to The Economist. Um, and, and, you know, it's just a great way to get snapshots of lots of different stories that you can click through if you, uh, you know, obviously you don't know how to use Twitter, but if you follow more of the financial stuff. Well, thank you to all three of our panelists and thank you to everyone who's joined us for this virtual Denison Connecting event. Um, Denison Connecting events are actually happening all over the country and all over the world. So keep an eye on your email. Um, if we're in your area, you will absolutely hear from us. 
And one quick blur before we go, if you want to connect with some of our talented dentists and students as a mentor to offer an internship or just give that 20 minutes of your time, you can do that by going to denison.wiser.io. That's W-I-S-R dot I-O. Um, in Wiser, you can use single sign-on with Gmail or with your LinkedIn account. You'll just get in there, mark your career preferences, and then mark that you're willing to speak with students, and then they'll be able to reach out. It does all the scheduling for you. It's super easy, and it's a great way to give back to Denison. Thank you again, and have a great evening. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.